Welcome back. It is always a good day. When I wake up, I give thanks. And then the realization kind of comes over me that today is a day that I am privileged to step out in my small studio in San Diego and connect and introduce you to another fascinating human being. Oh, you're going to love this woman because I do. I just am so excited to share her with you. Few housekeeping things. Um, oh my goodness, the podcast is growing. I don't know what's going on in Copenhagen, but Denmark, thank you for tuning in. Unbelievable amount of downloads that I just saw the other day. Uh, of course, United States, Canada, huge. Uh, Australia continues to be a big fan of the next room. New Zealand is now hopped on board. Um, just found a handful of new downloads out of South Africa. Welcome to the show. Uh, Ireland, the UK, Italy, um, and just kind of a handful of other smaller places as well. So the only way a podcast can and does grow is by sharing it by downloading, by telling your friends, hey, I love what this woman is doing. The next room is about death, but not just death. Um, it's about life. Uh, we cover every facet of the fascinating journey that we're on. Um, and of course, the thing that none of us are going to escape, which is the end game at the end of hopefully what is a life well lived. So thank you for tuning in. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, which is now X, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the woman I'm going to introduce you today was with me recently in the DRC. Uh, I quickly became a huge fan. Her name is Anastasia Hansel. She is a trailblazer of an empowered woman she was one of the very first people, I don't know if you recall a story in California from Wheels Across America. I actually was on the radio in Santa Barbara reporting on this remarkable journey, which I want her to touch on. Um, she's the one that got the whole party started. She's a mother to two grown sons. She has fantastic daughter-in-laws and a handful of beautiful grandchildren. Um, Boy, oh boy, what a great lady. And not to mention, widowed not once, but twice. So we're going to cover all of it. Anastasia, welcome to the next room. Thank you, Jane. Gosh, what a privilege. Um, I'm not somebody who has done a lot of podcasts. So um, this is kind of like a, a new venue for me a little bit. So um, I'm just going to try and be spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, here's the thing. I know you can handle it because I saw you in front of a huge group of individuals and not speaking English. You were actually addressing them in French. So let's start there. You were actually raised on the continent of Africa. Let's talk about that for a minute because that really plays into why you went back over to the DRC with Africa New Day. Well, um, I often say to people, I, I know it's a uh, it's a statement that a lot of people share. The Congo, um, I didn't choose the Congo. I think the Congo chose me. Mm. And um, so I was, yeah. I mean, I I was raised literally. I actually was born in Chicago. wasn't born in in the Congo, but as um, first thirteen years of my life, I, I was raised in the Congo DRC. And so uh, as a little girl, I went to an all French speaking girls school in Brussels, Belgium, because it used to be the Belgian Congo. So everybody speaks French. And so I learned how to speak French at a very early age. So that has been um, one of those, you know, in your toolkit, that has been a wonderful um, asset to what I do because I've been so involved in the Congo as an adult. But I was raised there for 13 years and then literally had the experience in 1960. That's when the Congo got its independence from Belgium. And so war was war was totally breaking out all over. And we were we had to flee for our lives. I remember the day that the, the Belgian military trucks came into our mission compound and it was like, get on the trucks right now. We, we have to leave at midnight tonight and, and travel all the way to, um, it's called Bungie, which is a part of the, um, in Africa there. But the United States Air Force came in with their huge big C-124 Globemasters planes. And we all 
we all got on those huge planes. And I just remember as I boarded, all the women and children had to flee and um, all the men were uh, left behind. And I just remember getting on that plane and <clears throat> looking out of the plane window. And I saw my dad on the tarmac because all of the men were being left behind due to the potential of tribal warfare. There. And so I just remember it was one of those things where you go, wow, I wonder what's going to happen to my dad. You know, and I didn't, I didn't know if I would ever see him again um, mm -hmm. because of the war. So I, I know what it's like to have to flee from your home. And um, uh, it was just so in going to the Congo, <clears throat> there's so many displaced people there. And we were we were with them this last trip. And I just I just wanted them to know that their story now, what they were going through now is not the end of their story, but it's just something that they're going through, but hopefully it will become such a part of their story that they will be able to help others in the future that all of a sudden trauma has hit and they don't know what to do, what the next step is, but there is, there is another chapter, you know, to be played. So that was kind of like what I hope to bring them a little bit of that message that I know what it feels like to have to leave everything you've ever known as home. But, you know, it's um, it's just it's a process and it's tough and it's hard. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't wish that on anybody. But even you think of in Ukraine now, you know what's going on there. I mean, people are just being ravaged and. Right. Um, so it's just one of those things that gives you a real heart. And whenever I see people having to flee for their lives, I just, I just remember, I remember what that felt like. Mm. Didn't you find it um, uplifting mm. to feel the hope of the Congolese? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's remarkable what they're going through. I mean, there's, you know, the refugee camps, there's the homeless situation, um, the mounds and mounds of rubbish and trash that's being dumped um, in the civil unrest. But yet, everyone seemed to have a glimmer of hope that, that perhaps they can return their country to a safe environment and maybe go through what Rwanda has gone through since 29 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really true. And, and I think we all will, we will never forget. Um, I know there's a, there's a place in scripture that says that Jesus saw her. And I thought to myself, we saw Benjamin and um, this, this young, young guy, he was amazing um, because he, he, he was part of the entrepreneurial school of Africa new day and he'd come up through the through the ranks coming from nothing and he told us his story that he wanted to be a part of the solution of Congo's problems and it's just as we all were just stood in awe at his story of how he literally i kept saying to people every day we are going to Benjamin's office which is literally the dumps but he started you know he couldn't even afford to buy plastic water and plastic bottles for what he wanted to do how he wanted to repurpose plastic remember and so he yeah. said he hired he hired these little kids that the dump is already their playground so let's go find all the the plastic bottles that have been used and then he got all those plastic bottles and told us the story of how he repurposed that plastic used plastic bottle into bricks that he then you know paved the whole uh, schoolyard of Africa New Day. I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me? Phenomenal right. story. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a resilience and hope and Congo has problems, but I want to be a part of the solution. Mm. That's also, I've been, my, my whole life, I've really been an advocate for women. In fact, I've been a founder and a developer of Global Women in Leadership Network. Um, World Vision had hired me years ago to found and develop a women of vision for world vision. So I've been very much an advocate for women. But what really stood out to me, because I worked for many years in Congo as an adult with rape warfare survivors. And, um, you know, they're, they're victims. And when you, I remember the first day when I came to Heal Africa, which is the hospital there in Congo, in, in Goma. 
And 13 women piled out of this van and they were just like dead women walking. They had all been tortured, raped, abused, whatnot, but they were coming to the hospital to get the needed fistula surgery. And when you work with these people for years, I just found myself getting really angry. And I thought, why doesn't somebody come out here and start working with the men? Because the worldview of women in these cultures has to change. It is not okay the way that they're being treated. And that's exactly what Africa New Day has done. They have started, I mean, they work with women of Congo, they work with men of Congo, but what they decided to do was, hey, let's, let's deal with the problem here. Let's deal with the men and their paradigm of women in this culture. And they started with one man, I think, in 2010 or something like that. They've had like 53,000 Congolese men go through their program. And they are no longer, these men graduate, no longer being perpetrators of women, but becoming protectors of women. Mm. And it's phenomenal. And so Benjamin is one of those examples of somebody who is, you know, he's thriving amidst the dump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no amazing. kidding. What a great story. I was uh, so impressed. And and the fact that he's 22, yeah. like I shared his story with my children that are a little older than that. They're in their mid to late 20s. Yeah. And, you know, to have the vision that he has and he was bothered by something, but he didn't just let it go. He was like, this bothers me that my country my city is an absolute mess and people just discard all of their trash anywhere they they want to and so that bothered him and he turned around and he's um he's making a difference he's he's a leader that one's going to be yeah. doing some great things for the congo in the future let's talk a little bit about um i want to get personal because after i met you um it was just remarkable to peel back the layers you know, we're chatting. I tell you I have a podcast and you said I've buried two husbands. Um, how do you go on from something like that? I mean, how did you, first of all, let's just talk about that and the fact that you were a caretaker and um, that you're still, you haven't even done a celebration for life um, for your one husband that's coming up in the very near future. Right. Um, so I, I, <laughs> I've said to so many people when they say, well, are you going to retire or whatever? And I say, retirement is not in my vocabulary. No, I'm just so grateful. And I think health, I know I read a great book by Paul Tournier, which who is a famous Swiss psychologist. And I think it's a, it's a book called learning to grow old. And he, um, he, he really said there that your health is truly what determines what you're able to say yes to. And um, and then when you say, no, I don't think I can do that again. So I I'm just have been gifted with health and energy and passion and vision and mission. And um, I've led all women's cycling venues for 30 years, um, which, you know, has been a huge, huge um asset to you know what i've been able to to accomplish in terms of helping uh women um globally but um so i was but i have said to people no i'm not i'm not retiring from what i do but i said i am retiring from caregiving because i said i have been a caregiver for 54 years oh. and i'm not doing that again <laughs> yeah so um with tim hansel um that I was married to him and um, he was phenomenal. He uh, has written about 10 different books and he was a mountaineering survival specialist that um, happened to, um, he took a, a mountaineering accident and um, where he fell seven stories, landed on ice. And so he ended up living in chronic pain for 30 years. And, but he was phenomenal. I just, um, you know, I met him when we were cycling across the United States and he was speaking to about 5,000 people at this gathering in Michigan. And um, I just never seen anybody like him. I just thought, whoa. And so to have had the privilege of being married to him, to a, a major leader of leaders um, was, in, but then also to see him deal with the fact that he lived in chronic pain and how he got up on that stage each time was tru truly a miracle. So when he died, um, he died in 2009. Um, I 
I went, he was this mountaineering survival specialist. And so he did all of his coursework in the high Sierras. And there's this lake there. It's called Jackass Lake. Which, you know, we all had to laugh because that's where Tim wanted his ashes to be, you know, a kind of over Jackass Lake because that was a mountaineering course venue. And so I decided when, when I went to the crematorium to pick up his ashes, um, I just said, I'm going to have to, I have to, I'm backpacking, we're, you know, trudging up to about 10,000 feet, taking his ashes to Jackass Lake. So I need something very, very um, um, light. I don't want a heavy container. And when they brought out um, his ashes, I could not believe the box that they that they brought out. And it was the message that was on the box that I just thought, oh my gosh, Tim would love this because it's, you know, it was the message of his life. But if you can see this, this is the box that <laughs> this is the box that the ashes came in. And with these oh my gosh. big old letters, temporary container. And I thought to myself, Ugh. what is what we all are? Yes. All temporary wow. containers. And mm -hmm. I've said so many times when I've done some speaking, I've said, you know, um, who cares if you're black or white or yellow? If you're male or female, if you're um, whatever gender you are or whatever that we get so hung up on. I said, when we cease, when we exit the planet, I say, or when we step into eternity, we're just temporary containers. We are here for <laughs> a period of time, you know, and this is how our life happens to look for now. OK, so that was just such an unbelievable message to me. And then but also what um and like you're saying how did i continue to go on after you know being a widow two times now what was incredible whenever we went around speaking we were we lived in such chaos because of all of his medical issues but we were constantly looking for this little book and because it had to go with him wherever he went and so what what i could not believe is i remembered this little book because the title of the book is to celebrate the temporary Mm. And I just thought that is phenomenal because wow. here temporarily, okay, whatever, whatever that happens to look like in life, but our calling is to celebrate the temporary. And, and I think that's what I've just chosen to do. I just want to keep on celebrating life in all of its fullness with the, with the sadness with the joy, with the whatever, but just to keep on, uh, Tim wrote this book, you got to keep dancing. And, um, and it's the, I guess the, the most oft quoted line in that book is that pain is inevitable as we walk through life, but misery is optional. Mm. And I think that that's the challenge to all of us, you know, is just to, um, yeah, pain is inevitable. And we were immersed in such sad scenes in the Congo DRC. But misery is optional. And Benjamin got that. You know, he wasn't going to wallow around in misery. He he wanted to be a solution to the problem. Right. And I think African New Day is the same way. They're not going to just continue to allow men to abuse women. They're going to start working with these men and say, this is not all right. Right. 53,000 Congolese men have gone through their program. So it's a game changer. And I just... I guess I I just always want to be a part of something that brings hope, you know, to to mm -hmm. um, whoever we happen to be with and have the privilege of being with. Um, so that's kind of a little synopsis. And then my my current um, then I, so I was a widow for seven years after Tim died, and then I married again, and then I was married for seven years, and um, that Daryl just died in April. And then we went, um, we went to the Congo. <laughs> yeah. So um, wow. I'm just, I'm just, I guess I'm grateful. Um, I know what it's like, you know, to go through deep sadness. Um, but I also know how important it is to tap into that resilience, um, that hope, and that knowing that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Mm. So I just, um, I choose to, um, live life that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, that connection to your higher power of your understanding um, is really 
uh, kind of keeps you going, right? It's just, yeah. I don't know how people really do function without having uh -huh. that connection to, yeah. you know, people call it all different things. God, uh, higher power, divine beloved, Jesus, you know, Allah, whatever. But um, it really is a key factor in sort of being able to have hope. Yeah. You know, that that faith is is really quite something. Let me just clarify for a second. So Tim's book that he took everywhere was to celebrate the temporary by oh. Clyde Reed, correct? Exactly. Okay. Little, little. okay. So so here's your husband. He he doesn't go anywhere without this book to celebrate mm -hmm. the temporary. He crosses over to the next room. Right. You go to pick up his remains, <laughs> and he's in a box called temporary container yeah. that yeah. is such a great sign and how i'm always telling people they're still with us you know the sense of humor um that you know that wasn't there is no such thing as a coincidence in my world i believe that that was you know just one of those divine signs from the beyond. I yeah. just think that is so great. Yeah. Um, I will put a link to Tim's book too. You got to keep dancing because I do a show page with notes. And, and so if people are listening, they don't have to go search for it if they'd like to purchase uh, the book. Cause it sounds like it's a really cool book. Yeah. Um, so my goodness, um, is there anything that you have or any wisdom that you have to share with my audience about grief and the process and how you personally um, went through your levels of grief. Is there anything you can share? Because grief is a big one. You know, we grief, we grieve the loss of our loved ones. We grieve the loss of a job. We grieve the loss of finances. There, there's all types of grief. You know, there's so much, there's sickness. Um, the whole COVID thing that was, that brought out a whole depth of grief. Um, anything to share with us? Well, I, I, there's a, I don't just know the actual address right now, but in the book of Psalms in the Bible, it, it talks about when we go through the Valley of Baca, which is basically the Valley of weeping, um, we make it a place of springs. And, um, you know, so I just think that that, that's truly, um, I'm not somebody who, um, wants to wallow in, um, despair, um, to acknowledge it. I, I just remember even when, um, even most recently when Daryl died and I would initially I'd wake up in the morning and it was just like, okay, things have changed. There's a game changer here. He's no longer here. And um, so, and life is full of transitions all the time. There's transitions. And so, so I just think that um, with each transition, we have the opportunity to make a choice, <laughs> you know, whether how, how I'm going to do this and am I going to, um, it, I believe it takes courage to be strong and it takes strength to be courageous. Mm. And so both of those things are, you know, that's what you, you tap into is, um, okay, how, how am I going to move forward, uh, today? And so even though I wake up in the morning and there's this obvious sense of deep loss, he's no longer here, like you say, he's in the next room. Um, so I just, um, yeah, it's, it's that thing. I just think it comes down to making a choice, um, how I'm going to do today, um, and trying to just continue to, to move forward. I just want to always be somebody who moves forward and a great book that we just, um, that I took with me <laughs> when, uh, we went to the Congo, it's called Manifesto for a moral revolution. Mm. And um, she talks in here about, and this is truly, I like to be somebody who I call it a, a fifth rung leader. And a lot of times what I do when I speak is I literally bring in uh, ladders, big ladders. And one of the ladders, I, I call it the character ladder. And the other ladder, I call it the capacity ladder. And the capacity, the ladder is all about what our culture, you know, dwells in its possessions. What do I have performance? What do I do 
position, how important am I, and personal appearance, what do I look like? And that's what's a lot what our culture, you know, is kind of filled with and what people pursue. But I prefer to be on the character ladder. And I, I love um, David, um, whatever, it's, it, his book, the book of character, David Brooks, who writes for the New York Times, and he, his opening statement of his book was just, it's so, it's, it's worth um, <laughs> being alerted to. But he said, lately, I've been thinking about the difference between eulogy values and resume values. Mm. And resume values are all Ow. about the capacity ladder dwells in. Resum, uh, eulogy values is what the character ladder you know, resonates with. And I, on the character ladder, you know, you find different rungs, but I always say, I want to be a fifth rung leader. And that is somebody who um, always makes choices to keep them on the growing edge. Okay. Uh, having the ambition to learn at the edge, I think is what we call it. And that's what we were doing in Congo, but the wisdom to admit failure you know, when we go, oh, that's, you know, I, uh, that didn't go right. But, and then the courage to start again. And I think that leadership, what I try and do is be somebody who, who leads because I don't want to become complacent. I just don't want to become complacent as I walk through life. And I even said to somebody recently, I would really like to speak on the dangers of spiritual plateauing. Um, because I think that's that's what we can fall into real easily as we get older, is we just, I, in fact, I sometimes I have a, I show up, when I was raised in the Congo, we had, I had a um, um, Zamba, who was my um, pet chimpanzee, and then I had <laughs> who clues the African gray parrot, and my, uh, we had brought back an African gray parrot one year, and Kukulu was literally in this cage at my sister's for so many years. So I said to her one day, I said, Christine, how long has Kukulu been in that cage? And she said, for 50 years. And oh. I said, that is how some people live their lives, just as I am. And there I will stay. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be that person. I want to be somebody who's constantly learning at the edge. And, and we learn at the edge when we say yes, like this, this time I said, yes, I was going to speak all in French. And um, I'm not sure I'm going to do that again, because I found out that, um, I mean, it was good for me to do that. But um, I just found out, you know, I, I don't like to be glued to my notes. I like to just kind of be with the audience. And so, and they're such great translators. I thought, heck, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to speak in English, have them translate. And then I'll periodically throw in, like I did French and Lingala, you know, and I, I all of a sudden I said to them, Anastasia, and they all just kind of roared. They couldn't they loved it. it. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So it's just, um, yeah, it's that thing of, um, I guess we saw that in the Congo, that resilience to keep on going mm -hmm. and, to not, and, and to learn at the edge, you know, to keep yeah. going. And that's what I think is each one of our challenges, no matter what has come is to just continue um, perseverance, you know, resilience, all those yeah. things of just getting up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are absolutely such an inspiration <laughs> and a bright light. <laughs> I mean, I just fell in love with you. And every time we were connecting over there, I'm like, oh, she has to come on my show. And I'm telling you, I take notes the whole, whole time I'm on the show. I'm going to show you this since you can see it. Oh, oh my gosh. YouTube, YouTube fans will be able to see it. Um, for those on the radio, it's just all of these quotes that you've said that I'm just absolutely uh, amazed by. I have a feeling that your children, your sons and your daughter-in-laws and your grandchildren must just be so excited to have you in their life and to think, Aren't we lucky that we have this vibrant woman who wants to learn at the edge and she's not sitting in a lazy boy waiting for the end to come. She's actually going to live right up until she, you know, drops her temporary container yeah. and transitions to the next room. Okay. So one final question. Yeah. I'd love to find out what people think. What do you 
think, hope, feel, have an intuition of will be waiting when you do drop your temporary container and transition to the next room. Some people call it heaven. Some say nirvana. What do you feel will be there waiting for you? Well, I, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. Yeah. When we step into eternity, I mean, it's, I was even sharing with my most recent husband, Daryl, I said, just as little, when little Blakely, my great granddaughter was just born, I said, she went from being incubated for nine months. And then all of a sudden she came into this world. I said, I just think it's the same thing when we step into eternity. It's a whole new form. It's a whole new, what we've never experienced before, you know? So I just, and um, for me personally, you know, I believe in the God of Christianity and I call him the most high God, but I do believe what it says in the scriptures that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And mm. so I, I just, I do trust that eternity is in front of me and that I will, I'm, I mean, I've heard the stories of people that have said, you know, they've, they've, they've stepped into eternity and, and come back you know and so you go wow um that has not been my experience but i sure have a lot to learn i mean it's exciting um so i just um again i think i think it takes tremendous courage to stand at that edge of eternity knowing that your your end times have come for you um so i i don't know i remember taking care of my mother-in-law and um when she said you know, she was dying and she said, turn off the oxygen. I went, turn off the oxygen, you know, and it was like, yeah, you know, and so I'm, okay. So it's that pivotal point, you know, where you just go, everybody has their own story, I think, of what happens. Um, so I don't know. I just, um, I just continue to walk by faith. I say, even when I cannot see. <laughs> mm. That's beautiful. You know? Anastasia Hansel is my guest today on The Next Room. Uh, what a beautiful interview with you. I, I'm just so pleased that you would take the time. I know that we were both pretty pretty pooped out after the long journey back. We actually had a, a, an 11-hour delay in Qatar, and we're just like, we were delirious. So I, I do appreciate you taking the time and, um, and how fun that you just live an hour or so away oh, from me so that I, we can, we can continue our relationship and, uh, and work together through Africa new day, because um, I'm so impressed by what they've done in the short 17 years that they've had that um, nonprofit going. Yeah. So uh, thank, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, what a privilege to be with you. My goodness. I mean, I, I'm as fascinated by your podcast as the, everybody else. The next room, it's like, whoa, yeah, tell me about <laughs> it. Oh, it's fun. It's been growing and, and uh, you know, and it and I, I refuse to have it be defined and be put in a box. You know, when right. I first started, it was death, dying, grief, green burial, right to die issues, right. hospice, whatever. But it has it's forcing me to grow because um, to get to death, we have to, we have to live. Right. Um, so it is almost a show more about life. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun and I keep meeting phenomenal people like yourself to bring on, to introduce to people. So and I, think, I think what you're doing is exactly what we've talked about. You have the ambition to learn at the edge. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm, I am. Yeah. Ever since I was just a little thing, I was always so curious. I, I think curiosity is such a cool trait. Like I'm, if every day when I can say to my husband or to my children, like, wow, I didn't know that yeah. every day when I learn something and I do learn something new every day, I'm so excited. It's yeah. just such a gift exactly. to keep learning, you know, and, well, and speaking, when, when we yeah. keep learning, we keep being a life giving individual yeah. rather than, you know, somebody that just has nothing, nothing to add, you know, yeah. it's just. Like a, uh, so I guess that's what that's what I want to keep being is somebody who's life giving, rather than um, you know being the one that I ask everybody else to please make me happy. 
<laughs> you know? So anyway, it's like I, I want to add to life, you know, rather than always wondering what I can get out of it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Well, you are, Anastasia. You are adding to life and you're adding to my life. And so you thank are. you for coming on the show. Uh the next room where death is dinner conversation. Um, I'm trying to think. I've got all kinds of cool people coming on because I met a couple um nurses on the flight back, which was amazing. Um, but I've got all kinds of really interesting people coming up on the show. So thanks again for tuning in. Thank you for the downloads. Thank you for the listens and the shares. Um, and please, by all means, if you can be anything on the planet, please be kind. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.